Ah! Oh, well. In this episode, there was a fire. Stocks were consumed. Rust was everywhere. Angel piss was used to break things loose. Ah! This is why you undo your mill syrups, boys. Inside, all gacked up. More angel piss. Lots of surprises underneath the stock line. Remove the old finish with a little bit of acetone. Look, Ma, the inspector's cartouche is still there. Steam up those dents. Oil her down, man. Rust as a bore obstruction. Fix those screws. Viola. Crag. Carbine. Fire in a collection. A triple F, which is aqueous film forming foam. All those things do not go together. This particular crag was in, a, was in a collection fire and sat in the foam for about two to three weeks. Bruno needs to see how the torsion bar on this lid works. All of those things indicate that we're going to try to save a crag. Let's get on down the rabbit hole because this is a deep dive. I wasn't kidding. This isn't the stock off of that crag, but there was a fire here. There was... And you say to yourself, oh my God, he's messing up this priceless rolling block stock. No, I'm not. What I'm trying to do is show you how far down we gotta go to get to the actual um, to get down to the actual wood. And even when we're here, the wood's been cooked pretty good. I'm going to go in a little bit deeper. Okay, so we're down to hard walnut when we're this far in. I mean, it's I had to take a lot off the side of that. This stock isn't going to get saved. It was already in a pretty bad condition to start with. It had there's a lot of cracking going on here. There were some issues with this stock to start with. Um, it's even worse as you get to the rear where we've lost enough of this stock. It's, it's not coming back. And I know everybody thinks that you can save it and you can't because even though I'm down to walnut here, even this walnut's pretty cooked. It's, it's, it's real punky. So um, let's, let's get over and start taking this crag apart and see what we can come up with. But I just wanted to show you this, let you know I wasn't kidding. This was an honest to God serious fire. And side note, a lot of what we're doing here works really well on guns that have been in floods. The crag's up in the vise now, and we had to do a little bit of work just to dynamite the bolt open. And I don't know what AFFF does to steel. I really don't know, but I will tell you that it does some pretty ugly stuff in terms of this rust in here. Um, to remove, we lift up on the extractor, kick the bolt open and pop the bolt out and we can see a lot of pretty bad surface rust here. Um, that's all going to have to get dealt with but I don't see any really deep pitting but this gun probably should have been gotten to five or six weeks ago. There's a clock running on a couple of these. This isn't the only one in the shop but it's the one that has a lot of historical value so it's the one I want to save. Same thing up inside the box. The box has got, it's, it's pretty bad up in here. We'll beat all of that apart and then we'll have to take the bottom of the mag off. And the reason why I'm not just diving into this is I want to know where I'm going to start lubricating stuff. So we'll take a little bit of this angel piss and just start getting everything wet here. Um, I've seen people do, they talk about croil, they talk about ATF with acetone in it. That's good. And I'm going to tell you this. If your particular proprietary blend of garbage gets it done for you, great. I'm not here to talk about it. I just know that 
uh, good old fashioned orange can croil is what gets it done for me. We'll let this soak for a little bit and then move up to the fore end. Switching camera angles. I don't want to use a lot of weight. Ah, man, if we get lucky. So, I've just learned two things by taking off this band. The condition of this gun was damn near white. You can see up underneath the band here. I don't know if anything rusted up in. We're really going to find out when we get up underneath the hand guard. Yeah. All right. This wood is a little tender here, if only because it's a hundred and something years old. So I'm trying to be real gentle, but there's a set of snaps. So I'm going to wait until I get the action out of the main wood. And then we'll attack this problem from underneath by pushing upwards on the clamps that are snapping it to the barrel instead of making the wood do all that work. Sidebar, for those of you that watched us run that great big flintlock a while ago, that thing put a little slice right across my thumb, and that's why the tape. This is an old electrician's trick for uh, compensating for being stupid. Don't apply any bending moments to this thing where they don't need to be. I'm handling this thing like it's eggs, because I don't know what I've got. We got Lucky here, and that one came out. That should be a machine screw, because that's coming all the way out. Okay, so we'll bring this up. That's a machine screw, and then I'm going to set this. There's a tray you can't see off camera, and you'll see it when we're all done here, where I'm laying all these parts out so that we can track them all. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. We're looking at this stock, all the inspector's cartouches on it. Everything is correct. This was actually a pretty nice gun before this happened. So my previous comment about the, the corrosion underneath the stock line, we're going to take that with a grain of salt. Okay. You'll tend to blow end grain out, so when you lift it, put your finger over it like that and lift the metal and lift the metal so you don't blow the end grain right here. You see all these things, they have these little flecks of wood missing, and that's why... Boy, Vey, this thing got whacked all the way down inside. Whew. It's like sugar rust up inside there. Okay, so now the reason why I've got this really, really loose setup, I've, the, the vise is like 18, 20 inches that way. I have it held in the, uh, in the vise so we can pull this off while Bruno does a pan across what we have to deal with. Oh, wow. Look at that right there. <whistles> Zoom in on that, brother. Push in on that and let them see what we got going on underneath the stock line. Yikes. Look at that flecking off there. Wow. Okay, so now this is why it's good that we did not try to go after this barrel bend. And in case you guys are wondering, oh, my God, he's getting penetrating oil on a stock. Are you kidding me? Right now, the penetrating oil on the stock is the least we have to worry about. We'll deal with the stock. The finish is boiled linseed oil anyway, so when we re-linseed oil it, it's oil, so who cares? All right. So I've got... Wow, that thing is just completely anchored in there. Okay, so I'm going to take a punch, and I may have to reach in front of you here to do it. But I'm going to get a punch right there on the bottom of that band. Can we see that? Right there. I gotta have the light there so you guys can see it. There we go, now it's moving. I'm gonna do the other one off camera. Yeah, I don't expect it to drop free, I'm just looking. And right there, and I'm gonna take a still of this and show you the still and we'll blow it up. There is a little bit of the original magnificent rust blue on this thing. Oh my God, I cannot believe they issued these things. To general infantry. I've rolled it up in the vise here because this had to come off because this device, and I'm going to tell you, I don't know what it is, but we'll find out. I thought it was like um, uh, to tension the screw or to, or to tension the rear sight. We'll figure it out. I'll tear it down and look at it. But that had to come off in order to allow this to come straight up. Holy crap. So, that's what we're fighting right there all the way around. 
This gentleman is why you take your mill serves out of their stocks. All right, we're going to punt here for a second and then come back around to the rear end while I make sure I know what I got to do next. That's a veritable cornucopia of fun under there. And then, okay, so now we'll roll, we'll roll into this. We'll look right here, all right. So, if I remember right, that has to come up just a little bit. Okay, that comes up. Let me get this in here and get a better camera angle on it because not everybody's ever seen the magazine on a Craig come apart. Okay. And then they're back here. We're going to just tap the pin. And there is a lot of spring force here, so I'm assuming that we're going to get a loud pop when all this happens. Dunk. Okay. Continue to pull that out. Okay, so that pin came out with the concordant rust, goop, just goop all over this thing. Now a lot of this is the uh, a lot of this oil that we're seeing here, and a lot of this orange ooze is because I did very liberally douse this thing. Step one when taking the machine apart, the first thing you do if you're gonna take the muffler off your car, the first thing you do is go down underneath there. We're gonna change universal uh, bearings. Get down there and get everything oil a couple hours before you begin. It make your life tremendously simpler. Okay, and then this whole mess is going to come out of here. This spring, there is a pretty epic spring right here. That's a spring, and that's what snaps this cap shut. So that's out, and then this should come up and out. That should come up and out that way. And then we have the follower here, and it has a literal dosing of just glock all over this thing. It's, it's nasty. But as you can see down in here, all of this orange stuff, this is almost worse than a cosmoline experience, but not quite. So that spring will send this whole thing flying unless you're careful. <laughs> Pull that out. Trigger mechanism is obviously designed to be pulled out in one piece out in the field. Guys, there are lots of cuts and fades here because I'm just trying to show you what the heck's going on in this gun without breaking anything. And a lot of it, I don't know if I've got pins that are fused in their holders. But this obviously rotates around that pin, so that pin comes out, and then that allows this whole thing to drop out. And then that's just going to leave the cartridge cut off back here. Also, I'm working at a really odd angle. I'm trying to let you guys see what I'm doing here. There's, I'm way over here when I really want my head right there. As we can plainly see here, the cartridge cut off comes out. E no, it doesn't. It almost feels like something is, is fused up in here, so we can see the plunger plainly right here. And there's the plunger, and I'm thinking maybe it might be easier to push it down from here. I don't take a lot of crags apart. I'm going to tell you that straight up, but maybe if we just compress that in there. There we go. Now, that's going to haul ass, so I'm going to hold my hand over this, pop that up so that this plunger didn't part company across the room. But, um, yeah, I'm not even going to worry about that right now. Is there a screw up in there? That's definitely spring-loaded, and we'll figure out how that comes out because I want to get down inside that tunnel. That was a bit of a surprise because I wasn't expecting it to come off, but this thing is nasty. I mean, good Lord. All right, the inside here, there's a collar that has to be depressed. And this is solid rusted together. So we're going to boil this thing as a unit. 
and then uh, I'll tear it apart after I'm sure I can get up in here and not shoot things across the room. The rest of this, yeah, there's a screw down inside here that once I get the spring unit clear, I can pull the screw. This is the other side of that screw. And once that comes out, then the extractor comes out and then we'll have the whole thing broken down um, into one unit. Okay, um, so I've got all this laid out on the table. We're gonna get we're gonna get our before shot. Here we go. Well, here it is in its majesty. It's about as far apart as I can take it until we boil it the first time. Um, we'll get all this hung in Thor. We'll get a small basket up. We'll start doing the conversion. You guys would be doing it in your gutter. Um, and we'll talk about the wood and why I didn't take this barrel band lock out, why I didn't take out the butt plate screws yet. We'll get there. And what we're going to do with the wood. But for right now, oh, there's one other thing I noticed while I was tearing it down. There's a screw right there. So I'm assuming if I pop that screw, I might be able to drive this forward barrel band off. But I'm not going to fight that and destroy that screw head. All right, so we're going to go boil this thing. And the next time you see the metal, it'll be at the end of boil out number one. And I predict this thing is going to take, it's going to take us two, possibly two and a half calendar days to shoot this video. Because you can't rush this. You've got one shot at it. All right, so we're going to go boil it, and we'll start talking about the wood here. Well, I had already done this before, but a little bit more angel piss here on this, uh, on this screw. Now, the back screw on this, the reason why I waited, and everything else is boiling right now, these things oxide jack. The rust occupies more space inside the hole than the original iron part did, and it literally sets itself into wood like a rivet, right? So I had, I've oiled this one, I've oiled the top one, but the bottom bolt right here, or if there's one right there, the part of the butt that gets grounded during drill, the part that gets set on the ground when you want to stand your weapon up and go grab something, always takes it in the shorts. And this thing, has, its head is all mauled and everything, so the first thing we had to do was find a screwdriver that would fit it, okay? And then, the screw is in there, just trust me. So I tap on it, light hammer. I'm not killing this thing. I'm just tapping on it. And then, let me get an appropriate screwdriver rear end here. So what I'm gonna be doing, you'll hear it, I'm gonna be tapping on the back of the screwdriver while I'm turning this thing. And what we're doing is shock loading it and making a low grade jackhammer and I'm applying rotational effort there it goes and we got lucky and it broke loose but I'm shock loading the screwdriver and then you got to make sure you rock it so that you stay down in and I'll clean this screw head up later I'll clean this thing up because this thing is nasty oh good lord there's barely a slot here and yes I'm not straight in and I'm actually turning this off to one side in an attempt to get a little bit of traction on this screw and try to get this going before it gets going here. <sighs> Shut down Rover QJV. Do the, do the. Rover, call me if you can on the QJV. All right. All right, there we go. That came out. Same deal up here, this screw here will have this screw driver bit put in it and tapped in. Now, don't use too big of a screwdriver bit, either this way or widthwise, because it's possible you get a screw that, that's sitting down inside of a mortise. You can drive this in, actually split the head of the screwdriver apart this way a little bit and wedge it down inside the uh, mortise and again don't ask me how the hell I know that all right here we go all right okay here we go oh wow yeah these things are jacked up okay that's there now there's a lot of grain blown on a bottom down here 
the end of this toe has been blown up from having been beat on the ground compressions the grain actually runs this way it's running that way and if you do a stock right you want the grain run out to be up top not on the bottom you want the grain to grain to run this way um, I got a funny feeling that when this gun was made they weren't really too uptight about which way the grain was running all right so then I'm just tapping this now to knock all this loose. And again, we don't want to blow the wood out up here. We don't want to blow the wood out around it. We just want it to come out clean. Well, okay. We want it to cleanly depart the mortise. Whether or not what's underneath it or not is worth the shit or not. Let's take a look at this. Okay, here we go. Hang on. Ah, a lot of noise. Ah! Oh, wow. We have a combination of rust, oil, dry rot. Wow. All right, let's go up front. Here we go. So, this little device right here has kicked more people's rear ends. I swear to God. They come in here, they snap them off. You can't pry underneath this. On every one of these stocks, there's a hole. See that hole right there? The function of that hole is to allow you to insert this punch right back there. And now I'm sitting on the back of that. And then take your finger and put it right there. Okay? I want your finger right there. Because what I don't want is this piece of end grain right here to blow out. So in order to do all this, it's going to have to be my pinky. So you can see what I'm doing. But I'm just tapping on this. Okay, and it's clear now. And in fact, not only is it clear, it's actually free to rotate a little bit. But you get these things, they're so rusted. And that was no exception. Um... I don't even think that rust was caused by the fire. That's every freaking band locking spring I have ever pulled out of a stock. We're in the stock here, and I want to show this since this uh, acceptance mark on the bottom of this. And then we're going to roll this around and look for the U.S. inspector's mark here, which I may be able to get you right here in one shot. Hang on a minute. And there's the acceptance mark right there. Oh, yeah. Look at that. 1901 right there 1901 we're trying to preserve this and not make this thing look all washed out so what are we doing about the fact that um, this wood on this gun has been pretty much it's okay the finish was compromised but all of the wood is okay except for this right up here all this stuff up here at the front end, Bruno's going to pan over there to me. The wood at the front end has been beat up pretty well, but even it's, it ain't that bad. And I got to tell you what, I think this uh, fire might have done this gun a favor um, because it got it in here and got it conserved. We're still conserving and doing a little bit of refurb. Now, I'm going to use just straight up brake cleaner. Now you go, but that'll compromise the varnish. I got news for you. The varnish was compromised on this thing during the fire. Let's get back here. So just a regular, the low uh, aggression um, scotch brake pad. And what I'm doing is I am taking the top layer off of this gun. This thing is going to be flat when I'm done with it. It won't be shiny anymore. But we have to. The upper layer of varnish was compromised. And we need to get down underneath and start seeing this brown color. And that's the wood coming out. And there is a lot of oil soaked into this thing. Because this gun has had the living crap beat out of it. Okay. So we're going to do this all the way down a stock. And kind of strip this back with the grain. If you push hard enough, this will start leaving scratches. We're not trying to do that. We're just trying to gently get all of this this nastiness right here all of this mung we're trying to get this to come off the stock so we'll just keep sliding on down but the beauty of being this gentle is we're going to leave those inspectors cartouches alone we'll go after this now why not soap all right soap will do this also soap will take all of this off the real issue becomes you have to get all the soap off before you can come back and put an oil finish back on it. 
and I have every intention of putting an oil finish back on this gun. We're gonna, just going to put a layer of boiled linseed oil on this thing and tighten this up. But look at that. The collar is coming right back. And I don't know if it's coming out in the camera here. But yeah, look at that. So we're taking that entire top layer. There's some shininess right there. What I'm doing here to most people is sacrilege. And when I do a straight conservation, I don't do this to the wood. We very gently rub the stocks out with a little bit of steel wool, um, 4 aught steel wool. But that's about all we do. We don't go after this. However, again, the finish was compromised by the fire. I'm not the one that made the decision to destroy this. But I'm not having a rubber real hard, and we may have gotten lucky here. We may have gotten lucky. You can hear that right there. There's a spot right here where the grain blew out. Right up here, there's a spot where the grain kind of blew. We'll have to sort of iron that down a little bit, and we'll do that in the oiling phase. So here's, this part, here's the part about a crag that makes it so weak. The only piece of wood holding the fore end to the back end, this is almost like a fore end connector piece. This stock will bend here very easily in both dimensions. And all of the recoil is borne by the rear by the rear um, face of the stock. Let me bring that up here and take a look at that. Let me see if I can get down low enough here. There we go. So all the recoil is taken by that deep groove right there the light in that groove so you can see down in there. That's a lot deeper rear groove than rear tang uh, groove than you would ordinarily see. So these stocks, this gun is, is kind of weak and I believe that that was born out in military service that these guns had a nasty tendency to crack right here and that's why I was saying in the beginning you got to handle this thing like it's an eggshell because out once you strap the front of the barrel to this thing, once you strap the barrel up to it, this all turns into one big rigid unit. But if this works loose, this sucker's going south on you in a hurry. Going back over to this acceptance mark right here. Actually, it's actually showing up pretty well in normal light. Put a little bit on there. And just very gently rub through it. We don't want to take the edges off of this. We want that to be nice and sharp. One of the thing deals you get when things are sanded or buffed is that the front and the back edge on the buffer rotation will get wa will get washed out. It's called funneling, and uh, we don't want to do that. This whole thing is now turning a nice brown, and I'm going to finish this up, and then I'm going to we're going to pull the dents up. We're going to see if we can get these handling dents up with a little bit of steam. Ordinarily, steam will craze this finish and turn it white. But since we're buffing the finish off anyway, and we're going to put a new coat of oil on this, we want to lift some of the more gratuitous dents in this thing. But we don't want to pick them up too high because you get to a point where we could sand this stock down smooth and it'll look beautiful. But all the history is gone if you do that. And uh, it doesn't look correct. It's kind of like going to a rendezvous with brand new buckskins in a 250 year old weapon. I've never quite got that. There are two really obvious dents in this thing. And here's one of them right here. And I think this was caused when the, um, when the rack caved in on it. So this, this towel is soaking wet with water. And you lay that over and in this 1980s vintage monocoat iron that I bought when I was in the Navy supplies the heat. Now, if the fibers of the wood are cut, this won't work. But if the fibers in the wood were just dented, we might succeed. Look at that. And getting some of the bottom of that to come up. Now, that alarm you hear going off in the background... If you heard it, that's that's the alarm telling me that the uh, the parts are done uh, converting on their first pass. You can ignore that alarm for a few minutes, but then you run out of water and all kinds of weird things start happening.
Okay, I think that's actually about as good as we're going to get that. Now I'm using the edge of the towel because that's where all the water is. I'm just trying to drive this heat down into the wood fibers. Again, if you do this on a military finished stock that you're not going to re-oil, this will come up white and you will know that you did it. So if you commit to using heat and making steam, just understand that there is a very real possibility that you might screw something up. Right. There's another one right there. There's one right there. I'm just trying to get it so that the camera can see it. We're, I would never be working at this angle, but I want you guys to possibly see what happens. So we're going after that bad boy right there. That's a sharp crease. And I think this thing got knocked over in a pile of stuff. And we're just going to see if we can't get that dent to come up a little bit. Uh, hang on. Having a low dexterity day here. And I don't want to pull every dent out of the stock. It's got to look correct when I get done. That pulled about half of that out, actually. It changed the uh, reflectivity of the... Let's see if we can get in right there. You see, it's got like two dimensions to it. There it is. So that's actually coming up fairly well. I don't want to bring it all the way up and I don't want to sand it out either because if I sand it out there'll be a big spot on this stock where right now the pores are filled on this thing. This stock has had finish on it for a hundred and something years, 119 years and the pores are full to the surface. If we start cutting down below that and start scrubbing below that, there'll be a big open spot right here. And oh my God, you'll be able to see that from across the freaking parking lot. We've steamed up dents. We've polished this down and we haven't opened up any of the pores. And I think we got lucky here. I really do think we got lucky. So then we put a little bit of dark stain. When you mess a stock up like this, go dark. All right. The only way to go light would have been to strip all the finish off of this but we're going to put a dark oil on this what it, how it was finished originally and let this soak in now i'm not fixing a lot of the ills with this stock but we're going to let this soak in and i'm going to tell you what you can't beat what that's going to look like when this is done and we buff it out and we do a couple of layers of oil on it which is more than it would have had originally but we're getting back now to the point where we, we are refurbishing this piece of equipment. We are making it operate and be the way it should have been when it was kind of new. We have not come to the decision of whether or not we're going to reset this thing or not. So we conserve first, which is stop it from decay. Then we refurbish, we make it run, and then we make the decision whether or not, uh, and, and here's the decision. If the bore on this thing is ruined beyond operation, it's going to turn into a movie prop. And if that's the case, we're going to blow it. Because if it's all the way out of service, it's got to look like something a trooper could have been carrying when it was 10 years old. If it runs, if the bore is okay, then I'm going to call its owner and go, here we sit. We don't have any oil on this thing. Do you want me to put a coat of rust on it and knock the sheen back? What do you want? I don't know. We'll see. Well, I'm telling you what, first conversion, we went ahead and wheeled off and it came out pretty clean. But here is where this gun's going to take a left or a right turn. And it depends upon what comes spraying out of this. Oh boy, you see that puff of smoke? Let's do that a couple more times because the heart of every gun is the inside of the bore. I can fix everything else. But if the bore is trash, this is where this gun's going to take a turn between being an active uh, weapon that you can actually run live ammo in and a blank firing um, prop gun. This is owned by the same people that own the, um, the Ferguson rifle. So they would rather have it live fire and so would I. 
Um, but if it can't, then it'll get turned into a prop gun and then there are some specific things we have to do. Gentlemen, I want you to remember, in spite of all the fooling around, rust is a bore obstruction. You must get all of this rust out of the bore. You cannot shoot it out. In this particular case, I honestly believe from the amount of Cosmoline that was in the bottom of the stock, that this is fried Cosmoline, which is a new level of gacked up. Now that the ladder of life has been strung, a chimney sweeps on the bottom most rung. But I spend my time in the ashes and smoke. In this whole world, there's no happier blow. Well, by now, Bruno has figured out to do a split screen before and after on what this metal looked like on this gun. Trust me, unless you've got pitting going deeply into the barrel or the receiver, what you think is a complete total loss isn't. Just don't wire wheel it right off the bat. Boil it. We have a ton of conservation videos up in the conservation videos tab on my YouTube page that explains. And go to the sour barrel if you the sour barrel episode if you want the short version of it. And go to Conservation 101 if you want the long version of what's being done here. But I'm not going to cover every single aspect of this every single time I do a video on it. We're done with the first pass of conversion now. Everything's been through the steam and the hot water one time. We've dynamited a lot of that charcoal out of the inside of the barrel, but we're not quite done. It's a little bit adulterated here to here. But as you can see, after the before and afters, we got rid of all of that scrode, and there's no pitting on it because we got to it fast enough. That's the good news. We saved the stock. That's the good news. Here's the bad news, and here's why you buy the book first. Bruno's going to hand me this. I was loaned this book um, today. I was loaned this book by a gentleman on the other side of town. This is a pretty damn rare book, but it's everything you needed to know about crags in one place. And I'm going to tell you what, that book right there told me that this gun is the mutt of mutts. We looked up the serial number on a receiver, and this is a rifle receiver with a carbine barrel screwed into it. The serial number range is wrong. They only made 5,000 in one of these things um, in uh, 1898. And then in 99, they made actually made in 99. Well, the rear sight's off in 1901. The stock cartouche, the inspectors, the acceptance mark from the head armor at Springfield says 1901. It's got a firing pin tip off of a 96 or earlier. There are a lot of things here that just say that this is a mutt. And one of the things they caution in that book is, beware of 98 carbines. It says that there's, there's an entire page on it because 98 carbines were easy to make spuriously. So this is going to get cleaned up, fired, but it's gonna be a movie prop, guys. And it's gonna get blued and it's gonna get turned into a full-on movie prop and it's gonna live its life out as a collection of parts. That's hard to take. We're 100% positive that Lawrence of Arabia or George Patton did not carry this weapon. It was not in the Philippine insurrection. It was not down in Puerto Rico. It just wasn't. It is what it is and it's a collection of crap that looks like a carbine. So anyway, I'm sorry about spouting off on that. But the important thing to remember is buy the book before you invest the money in the gun. Golly, I'd like to own a crag. Great. Guess what? I know a lot more about crags right now than I did yesterday. And that's the important thing. The easiest way to double your money when buying a firearm is to fold it in half and stick it back in your pocket. Don't reach for a grinder. Reach for a hammer with a polished head. And we're just going to start driving this metal back. I have it set down inside of a hole here on my bench block and we got it jacked up on top of the vise where you can see it. But all I'm, I don't grind metal off of a gun. All that metal was there for a reason. Dremels are great tools, but they're, they're 
they're used far too often in anger. All right, here we go. Oh, hey, just to defend the Dremel, guys, I own four of them. They're around the shop. They get used a lot. Just letting you know that, oh, hell, if you want to get really crazy. Oh, he has a can of WD-40. Re. No. Okay. Anyway. All I'm doing is pushing the metal back into this slot. We'll lift this screw out of here and set it down on the top of the bench. And usually it's a little bit long right there. Now we're going to come back to that focus. So just, yeah, we're there. Okay, we're good. Very good. And we're going to come back up here and set that back in again. Bruno's chasing my focus all over hell and back. It's a butt plate screw, so let's not worry about it. Let's just take a hacksaw to it now and clean it out. The real issue was there's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy here is that slot gets screwed up and then the screwdriver sits up further and further and further in it and it just gets more and more and more hacked up. Now you don't want to cut down too far. I'm just going to go ahead and sort of slice this up a little bit. And what that's going to do here is produce a screw head with a, with, with a little bit more depth. Now we'll look down the inner. See what I mean? Now I got some more depth and a common screwdriver can actually get from side to side and get some torque on this beast. Are we going to be able to get all that, that gack out of the center? Not really. This isn't a very thick head. I don't have a lot of room to push material in here. So we're going to live with that. We'll clean it up a little bit. The screws on um, all the screws and all the pins on a crag are supposed to be fire blued and they call it oil blued. Um, so that's just in the universal work holding system here. We'll go ahead and rig a torch. Got my tub of oil sitting back there. All the screws and pins on a crag are supposed to be um, oil blued. Um, so we're just going to heat this up. We we'll heat the bottom up first. And the reason why I like heating these screws up from the bottom is, is I want the heat to go up the stem, right? And then appear in the center. And I want the colors to bloom from the inside out. That's just a personal preference of mine. You'll find that screws that have been fire blued have a tendency to rust a little bit less. So let's see here. Is it starting to change colors? I gotta get it to where you can see it. There it goes. Now it's starting to turn blue. Yeah, and we didn't polish this. Let me just dunk it in oil here. You can see how it's almost turning black. And the lighting in here and the way this camera is set up isn't gonna really show it to you. But if you look at all the colors that something goes through, and when you're all done, you wind up with a screw head that looks pretty decent and can actually make a case for the fact that it bent on a butt plate all that time. If I polish all these screws and make everything nice and shiny and pretty, um, we're right back to the table lamp in the French whorehouse. The rest of this rifle is pretty straightforward to put together. The magazine kind of baffles people, so we'll, we'll look at this magazine. This is the follower that's going to push the cartridges around the corner. They're going to come in here and then the follower is going to drive them around the corner and present them down here where my finger is. So that, there's an orientation here that that will slip down into. Did I get too high? There we go, right there. So that peg goes in there and then this rotates. And the way it rotates is there's a spring that's gonna push right there. So that spring is gonna give you the spring-loaded thing to push through. So that spring is gonna sit right there. Now. There's an interrelationship between the follower and this tab right here. And this tab is going to sit up underneath. It's going to go underneath this follower right here like this and roll in. And then that whole thing is just going to sit down and there's a pin we're going to put through. Let me make sure I got up underneath that. There it is. Okay. So there's a pin that's going to go from here to here. And as you can tell, there's a pretty honking spring here trying to keep this thing from moving. So the pin 
you leave a little bit of a, hang on a minute here, let me roll this over so I can show you what I'm doing. Here we go. So right now we've got that spring catching there and we've got the lid catching. So when this thing's all the way in, it's going to come down and hook like that. So we we'll stick the pin in and now we just got to get the uh, get the Kung Fu grip thing going on here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shove this in by grabbing it. And that's going to allow this pin to slide up into this position here. And we really got to get on it. And it helps if this thing's, I don't know how you could have done this in a field. You'd have had to have a vice to really get this. This piece here comes down flush and then rotates back until that edge drops over the top. And that's kind of how it's caught. That's actually a spring right there. Okay, so when you do all that, you wind up with this, where, well, it's hidden here, but that spring is doing two things. It's pushing the follower around, spring-loading the follower down here, spring-loading this. Okay, so when you open this thing up, it kicks the follower out of the way, and if you drop a cartridge in it, right here, the cartridge can come through, right? So when you go to shut this thing, the cartridge is here. Now, in order to bring it around the corner, this lid sits down on this. So this lid will be sitting right over the top like that. And this will just right around the corner. It'll come right on around and get pushed up into here. Now, if you don't want it to get pushed up into there, you have the cartridge cut off. The cartridge cut off, let's see if we can get it up in there so you can see it sticking out. The cartridge cut off is this bad boy. And when it's like that, the cartridge is allowed to present to the bolt. This thing doesn't feed up from the bottom like a standard gun, it feeds from the side. When you have this rotated, it obstructs the rim from going around the corner, rotate out of the way, and it allows the rim to sit here in a position where as the bolt comes forward, it can just strip the round off. So everything you know about bolt action rifles is kind of 90 degrees out because this is straight up and down. So all this feeding action is coming in here off the side and then up into the chamber. This cover goes on. There's a lip here and then that cover just sort of comes up in and drops down in there like that. We'll open this up and get it out of the way. So I've had to persuade this gun ever so slightly to get it to go back together again. And I don't know how you could have done this in the field. And I don't think these guys were probably allowed to take this gun this far apart. I'm guessing that this had to be an armor doing this. Okay, let me get a block of wood here so I can really get down on this thing. Yep. It's not quite there yet. Yeah, it is. It's there. Okay. Again, light taps, but I got a polished hammer, so I'm not leaving any marks on this thing. The 30 US, 3040 Crag, call it what you want to call it, rimmed round, kind of had one foot in each side of history. It's not quite powerful enough to hang with a 30 odd six. Um, it runs better than a 3030. It, it, it's good, but when we put it up against a seven millimeter Mauser down in Puerto Rico, ah, it's a little light. In the interest of full disclosure, I have already fired this thing off the test rig and I know it's gonna go bang. The bore is silver. I'm fine putting it up on my shoulder. I've already done all of that. So the way this thing was loaded was you were supposed to be carrying loose ammo in a pouch. They've tried a variety of quick loaders for these things. And to be really honest, not so much. So you can see the round in there and it all feeds from the side. But these things, man, are flipping butter. Just so smooth. Just look at that. Instant ejection. Oh, rah. You got to love that. And I'm going to tell you what. This thing has been a pleasure, and we really brought it back from the dead, didn't we? Oh, yeah. 
Well, we basically went from this to this. And even though this gun may be a mutt, it runs, the bore is silver, and we successfully saved it. Um, for those of you doubters out there that think you can't save your gear, you can. If you ever find one of these crags, I'm gonna tell you what, butter, and as always, a pleasure.